on World News Tonight. Unlimited power. Xi Jinping secures an unprecedented third term as China's president in a ceremonial vote. More tax. Russia unleashes a flurry of missiles targeting Ukraine's power supply. Airport protests. Israelis protest against Prime Minister Netanyahu's rule in the latest uproar against the administration. And clinic for teddies. Belgium welcomes kids to a teddy bears clinic where hospitals aren't as scary. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and you are joining us on World News. Now we begin in China as Xi Jinping secured a president-breaking third term. As president of China today during a parliamentary session in which he tightened his control of the world's second largest economy as it emerged from a Covid slump and diplomatic challenges mounted. Nearly 3,000 members of China's rubber stamp parliament, the National People's Congress, voted unanimously in the Great Hall of the People for the 69-year-old Xi in an election in which there was no other candidate. She has taken China on a more authoritarian path since assuming control a decade ago and he extends his tenure for another five-year term amid increasingly adversarial relations with the US and its allies over Taiwan, Beijing's backing of Russia, trade and human rights. Domestically, China faces a challenging recovery from three years of Xi's zero-COVID policy, fragile confidence among consumers and businesses and weak demand for China's exports. The economy grew just 3% last year among its worst performances in decades. During the parliament session, the government set a modest growth target for this year of just around 5%. Russian President Vladimir Putin was among the first foreign leaders to congratulate Xi on his third term. The two sealed a no-limits partnership between China and Russia in February last year, days before Russia launched his invasion of Ukraine. Xi set the stage for another term when he did away with presidential term limits in 2018 and has become China's most powerful leader since Mao Zedong, who founded the People's Republic. The presidency is largely ceremonial and Xi's main position of power was extended last October when he was reconfirmed for five more years as General Secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party. Addressing an investment forum this week, Malaysian Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim said his administration would not tolerate corruption regardless of an official's rank or political connections and pledged to tackle misconduct without fear of favour. Former Malaysian Prime Minister Muhyiddin Yassin said that accusations were politically motivated after he was charged with abuse of power and money laundering over projects launched under his premiership. The charges against Muhyiddin announced on Friday following an investigation by the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission or the MAC represent the most striking move yet against alleged malfeasance since Anwar came to power last year on a pledge to clean up the Southeast Asian nation's politics. Grace Lee Hui Yin, the head of Monash University, Malaysia's economics department, said though the MACC is officially independent of the government, the charges against Muhyiddin could bolster the reformist Anwar's anti-corruption drive and allow his government to showcase progress under his leadership. Anwar, a former student leader whose election capped an extraordinary three-decade journey from leader-in-waiting to jailed opposition leader and back again, has stalked much of his reputation and political legitimacy on rooting out corruption in Malaysia, which has been rocked by numerous cases of impropriety involving the rich and powerful, including the long-running 1MDB scandal. A number of people have been killed in a shooting at a Jehovah's Witness meeting hall in the North German city of Hamburg. Police say the gunman acted alone and is thought to be dead. However, it is unclear if the attacker is among the six or seven fatalities. Several people died in a shooting in Germany's Hamburg on Thursday at a place of worship used by Jehovah's Witnesses. Tactical teams stormed the building after they received a call around 9 p.m. Police say a shot rang out from the building as officers arrived and a dead person was found upstairs who they believe may be the shooter. A spokesperson said late Thursday they were still hunting for answers. <laughs> Authorities continued to seal off nearby streets and performed body searches on people. Local newspapers report that at least seven people were killed, while eight others were injured. The mayor of Hamburg said he extended his deepest sympathy to the families of the victims. He assured that forces are working at full speed to pursue perpetrators and clarify the background. Germany has been shaken by a number of shootings in the last few years, including one in 2019 outside a synagogue in Halle on the Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur, and in 2020, 
when a suspected far-right extremist shot dead nine people with Turkish migrant backgrounds in Hana. Russia has unleashed a barrage of missiles on cities across Ukraine, including the capital Kyiv, the Black Sea port of Odessa and the northeastern city of Kharkiv. The attack seems to have achieved its target as power supply has been cut preemptively to about 15% of Kyiv residents. Smoke rose over Ukrainian cities while people slept on Thursday, the aftermath of a huge wave of Russian missile strikes across the country. At least six civilians were killed, electricity was knocked out, and a nuclear power plant was forced off the grid. The majority of those fatalities, five, were in western Lviv, where drone footage showed a flattened home surrounded by badly damaged buildings. A body in a black bag was carried out of the rubble. This man is a local resident. This is horrible, he says. Russia is a calamity. Another civilian was reported killed by the missiles in the central Dnipro region. Three civilians were separately reported killed by artillery in Kherson. <laughs> in the capital, Kiev, residents like Ludmila were woken by the strikes. I heard a very loud explosion, very loud. We quickly jumped out of bed and saw one car on fire. Then the other cars caught on fire as well. The glass shattered on the balconies and windows. It's very frightening. Very frightening. The child got scared and jumped out of bed. The first big volley of missile strikes since mid-February shattered the longest period of comparative calm since Moscow began a campaign to attack Ukraine's civil infrastructure five months ago. Moscow says its campaign of targeting Ukraine's infrastructure far from the front is intended to reduce its ability to fight. Russia's defence ministry said the, quote, massive retaliatory strike on Ukrainian infrastructure was payback for a cross-border raid last week on a Russian village. Kiev said the airstrikes have no military purpose and aim to harm and intimidate civilians, a war crime. The strike knocked out the power supply to the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, Europe's largest, severing it from the Ukrainian grid. How can we sit here? The UN nuclear watchdog chief, Rafael Grossi, on Thursday appealed for a protection zone around the Russian-held plant. Zaporizhia nuclear power plant is running on emergency diesels. The last the last line of defense. This is the sixth time. Let me say it again. This is the sixth time that the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant has lost all of site power and has had to operate in this emergency mode. Let me remind you, this is the largest nuclear power station in Europe operating for the sixth time under emergency diesel generators. What are we doing? Ukraine says an unprecedented six of Russia's small arsenal of Kinzhal hypersonic cruise missiles were used, one of Moscow's most valuable weapons. Ukraine has no way of shooting them down. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un visited an artillery unit with his daughter, stressing the need to respond to any war preparations by the enemy. On the same day, the regime also fired a short-range ballistic missile towards the East Sea. North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un supervised artillery training on Thursday, according to North Korea's state news agency Korean Central News Agency on Friday. Kim visited the Hwasong artillery units on the western front lines to give hands-on guidance. He reportedly said that they must grow and maintain their power to overwhelmingly counteract and suppress the enemy's war preparations. It's possible that he's referring to this whole Washington joint military exercises, as the allies from next week will hold their biggest drill in years, dubbed Freedom Shield. Kim reportedly also took his daughter Kim Jue to the artillery training. She's already appeared by her father's side during several state events this year. The news agency's report follows North Korea's missile firing on Thursday. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said on Thursday that at around 6.20 p.m., North Korea fired a short-range ballistic missile into the waters west of the Korean peninsula. 
The South Korean military is also looking into the possibility of North Korea firing multiple projectiles that day. And from the newly released photo from North Korea, it looks like at least six artillery vehicles fire projectiles. It's also noteworthy that North Korea chose to fire off to the west coast rather than the east. It's the first time in four months that the North has fired a short-range ballistic into the West Sea, as the East Coast is their usual choice for missile firings. This latest provocation also marks their fourth confirmed missile firing this year. Let's go for a short commercial break. You're watching World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, Israel's president urged the government to abandon attempts to push through bitterly contested plans to overhaul the judiciary and seek a model with broad support as tens of thousands of protesters returned to the streets. Convoys of Israelis protesting judicial reforms converged on the main airport on Thursday, trying to disrupt a trip abroad by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, whose hard-right government is seeking the changes as well as a visit by Pentagon Chief Lloyd Austin. Protesters defied a heavy police deployment. Travelers were forced to get out and walk with their luggage. Protesters had called for a day of resistance. They fear the reforms would subordinate Israel's Supreme Court to the executive and foster corruption. The proposals have hit the shekel and alarmed Israel's Western allies about the state of its democracy. Nationwide protests have erupted weekly since January. The government is trying to change the system here so that the government can enact any laws that they want without any restrictions. Um, and moreover, they want to also have the power to appoint whichever judges they want. Uh, it's well known that absolute power corrupts absolutely. Austin, who is on a regional tour, planned to relay U.S. concern about escalating tensions in the occupied West Bank. Hours earlier, Israeli forces killed three Islamic Jihad gunmen there. Austin's visit was hastily rescheduled because of the judicial reform protests and his meetings relocated close to the airport. Netanyahu, who is on trial on graft charges he denies, argues that curbing the judiciary would restore the balance between the branches of government. Polls have found most Israelis want the plan to be shelved or amended. The Dutch government confirmed for the first time that it will impose new export controls on microchip manufacturing equipment, bowing to U.S. pressure to block the sale of some of its price chips printing machines to China. The U.S. and the Netherlands reached an agreement to introduce new export restrictions on advanced chip technology to China at the end of January. But until now, the Dutch government hadn't commenced publicly on it. China has condemned a move by the Dutch government to restrict exports of key chip technology. On Wednesday, the Netherlands said it would join the US in imposing controls to protect national security. That's important, as the country is home to a key player in the global semiconductor industry. ASML is the leading producer of the lithography machines that make chips. The Dutch government didn't mention the company in its proposed restrictions but did list some lithography systems as among those to be controlled. On Thursday, a Chinese government spokesperson condemned the move. China is firmly opposed to the interference in economic and trade cooperation and the sabotage of stability of global production and supply chains. This behavior is not in the interests of any party. We also hope that the Netherlands can seriously consider the causes for this situation and what should be done. The U.S. imposed sweeping export restrictions on chip technology back in October. But to be effective, they need support from the Netherlands and Japan, which are home to key suppliers. Now the Dutch move switches the focus to Tokyo, which is expected to outline its position as soon as this week. Speaking in Parliament, Japan's economy minister said nothing was decided yet. Tunisian President Kai Syed said that he will dissolve municipal councils months before they were due to be elected, further dismantling the systems of government developed after the 2011 revolution that brought democracy. Further tightening his grip on power, Tunisian President Kai Syed announced he would be dissolving municipal councils. Elections had been due to be held in the coming months. <laughs> We will be discussing the draft decrees revising municipal electoral laws and the election of national and regional council members. 
will also discuss another law that will dissolve the municipalities and replace them with special councils. Introduced after the country's 2011 revolution, these branches of democratic local government decentralized decision-making. Most of the over 300 municipalities are not run by the ruling party, but by independents and the opposition. Among them, Inada, staunch critics of Syed. The new special councils will also be elected, but only according to the rules written by the president. In 2021, Syed dissolved parliament and fired his prime minister in what critics call a coup. The president now rules by decree and says he is saving Tunisia from corrupt elites. In recent weeks, authorities have embarked on what Amnesty International has called a politically motivated witch hunt, arresting both opposition figures and journalists. A groundbreaking ceremony was held today for the Shaheen Project, a mega petrochemical facility in the South Korean city of Ulsan. The $7 billion project, which is the key fruit of South Korea's sales diplomacy with Saudi Arabia, is the largest single foreign investment in the country so far. South Korea-based refiner S-Oil has begun construction of its Shaheen project. A groundbreaking ceremony for the $7 billion project took place on Thursday in the southeastern city of Ulsan. S-Oil finalized a project in November last year when the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, visited Seoul. It aims to build a steam cracking facility and other units to produce up to 3.2 million tons of petrochemical products a year. When the Shine project is completed, it is expected to play an important role in diversifying the company's petroleum refining business by expanding its portfolio in petrochemicals from 12 percent to over 25 percent. The project has investment from oil giant Saudi Aramco, the largest shareholder of S-Oil, marking the largest foreign investment project for a single industry in South Korea. During the groundbreaking ceremony on Thursday, President Yoon suk yeol said that the project is a key achievement of economic diplomacy between South Korea and Saudi Arabia, pledging to provide a better environment in South Korea for foreign investment firms. Meanwhile, the project is expected to create 17,000 new jobs during the construction stage and an added value to the economy worth about 3 trillion won or over $2 billion. With the construction expected to be completed in 2026, South Korea's exports are forecast to increase by $900 million in the future. Welcome back, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese held bilateral talks with his Indian counterpart Narendra Modi in New Delhi. Albanese arrived in India with aims to strengthen ties between two nations through deeper trade investment and defence relations. Fiji's former long-serving Prime Minister Frank Baini Manara pleaded not guilty in a silver court after being charged with abuse of office and held in police custody overnight. As a Philippine Coast Guard aircraft flew over the disputed Sprackley Islands in the South China Sea, a message came in over the radio telling it to immediately leave Chinese territory. Such warnings from a Chinese Coast Guard ship have become an almost daily ritual around one of the world's most contested archipelagos, where Beijing is one of five countries claiming the strategic islands. Latvia began seizing cars from heavily drunk drivers this year, and as hundreds of vehicles began overfilling impound lots, they have decided to send them to the Ukrainian military and hospitals. A multimedia monument dedicated to U.S. abolitionist icon Harriet Tubman was unveiled in New Jersey City. Under President Joe Biden, the U.S. Treasury Department has said it's taking steps to resume efforts to put Tubman on the $20 bill. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again on Monday as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can always watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. Now, stuffed toys went under the knife in a Brussels operating theatre where medical students were running a workshop for children aimed at taking the fear out of hospital visits. We leave you tonight with the Teddy Bears Clinic where hospitals aren't as scary. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.